And we're diving in into another Soul of the Parsha class, and now we've arrived at Parashat Toldot. And as always, we're going to address just the first Aliyah, and our topic for today is balance. We want to learn a lesson in balance from the three fathers, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, uh, we want to talk about all three fathers. That's what we want to do tonight. Although Abraham passed away in the end of the previous parsha, uh, he's still mentioned at the beginning of this parsha. And in fact, we have something unique at the very opening verse of this parsha. We have a coming together of all three fathers, all three patriarchs, basically in one sentence. Uh, it's it, only Abraham and Isaac are mentioned explicitly. But Jacob is there implicitly also. So the verse goes, first in Hebrew, Ve'ele toldot Yitzchak ben Avraham, Avraham olidet Yitzchak. So the translation goes, this is the story, or this are the chronicles of Isaac, son of Abraham, Abraham begot Isaac. But if you look at the Hebrew word, which is the name of the parasha, toldot, it doesn't just mean the story or the chronicles, it literally means the offspring. So instead of reading this, these are the chronicles of Isaac, or this is the story of Isaac, we can read it more literally as these are the offspring of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. So if we interpret the word toldot to mean, to stem from, as it stems from the word lalede, to give birth to, then Toldot becomes offspring, and Toldot really alludes to both Jacob and Esau, the two twin children of Isaac. So in one sentence, we have the three fathers coming together. Of course, later on, they're going to be mentioned together many, many times. But in this is still, as their, this is the, the story of the middle generation giving birth to the third generation, and this story begins by mentioning the first generation. So in a way, we have all three generations in one verse. And of course, the main story of the first segment, the first Aliyah of this parasha, what we're focusing on this, year, this week, this year, is the story of the birth of um, Isaac and Esau. Yitzchak and Esau, the two twins. So it starts with, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, Isaac, sorry, I, Jacob, not Isaac, Jacob and Esau, Yaakov Esav. Uh, so it starts with uh, Isaac and Rebecca. I'm just going to use the Hebrew pronunciation because it's easier for me. Yitzchak and Rivka can't give birth, and then they daven, and they're, then they're blessed with twins. The mother is a bit confused by this uh, because she feels torn inside her pulled in two directions, and then they're both born, and, and, the, and it goes even on, this takes a long segment, it ends with uh, a, um, a sav buying the, uh, the, sorry, selling the merit of being the firstborn, the, the inheritance or the legacy, he's selling this to his twin brother, younger twin brother, Yaakov. So, but anyway, we want to focus on the fact that in the very first verse, we have all three fathers or patriarchs together. And, and of course, there's an interesting repetition here. The repetition is that we are told that this is the, again, story or offspring of Isaac, son of Abraham. And then again, it, it says, Abraham begot Isaac. So there, it's, there's a repetition here. Isaac, son of Abraham, Abraham begot Isaac. The, 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 both names are mentioned twice. So there are many explanations for this. One Hasidic explanation is that the, all the energy, all the power, all the uh, potential of Isaac to give birth to his twin children, it really all came from Abraham. It was one generation passing the energy, so to speak, to the other generation. So what we want to start off is we want to start off by talking about generations. We have three generations. We have a father and a son and a grandson, which turns the father into a grandfather. 
And we have a very, very deep dynamic of a family and of gen- what we call today the generation gap. We have three generations in which in, ev- in every generation, the child goes in the opposite direction of his father. And yet they create together a whole. Each one of them is part of a very deep meaning whole, because it's the three fathers of Judaism. And they're all together, they're called, you know, they they found Judaism. And it's not just the third one, and it's not just the first one, or just the middle one. Each one of them brings a very precious and important element to the to the picture. Sorry, I'm just going to hide myself because it helps me. Uh, each one is going is adding a piece to the puzzle. Each one is very precious, but each one is also insufficient. And and there's tension in this family, because every parent has certain expectations from their children, and these expectations are uh, are met with surprise, and they're challenged, and there even there's some sort of rebellion going on between each generation. So there's something very deep to figure out here, both on the level of families. We all have parents, and most of us have children, and we know the dynamics of parents and children, and we know that it's always there's always some tension there, and we want to figure this out. What is the, 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 the deep basics, you know, the foundation? This is the foundation of family dynamics, of intergenerational dynamics. And we want to figure out how these three generations ended up creating a very deep kind of balance. Like I said in the beginning, it's a, it's a lesson in balance. And also, what we also want to get from this is we want to get to know a very, very basic Kabbalistic structure, model, which is the correspondence of the three fathers to the three lines of the Sfirot in Kabbalah. The three basic Sfirot in the middle called Chesed, which is loving kindness, and I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the way that you can see it, this is, Chesed is on the right, and then Gvura, Might, is on the left, and then below them we have Tiferet. So this is what we want to delve into tonight. So we want to start with this. The, one of the names of Chumash Bereshit, of the entire first book of the five books of Moses, the first book, Beresh, Bereshit, Genesis, is also called Sefer Hayashar, the book of the straight or the book of the upright, in, in, in the sense that it gives us sort of a straightforward path, starting with creation, and, and, and you know, it, it leads on to the first Jewish family, and, and it's, it gets the story going on, on the right path, on the straightforward path. But the reason it's called this way is because of the three patriarchs. So although each one is going in a different direction, and although there's tension between them, all together they are called yesharim, straight, upright. Not because each one is whole, again, each one is, is an insufficient part of the whole, but because together they create this very interesting whole. So this is what we want to figure out. Now, um, there's an, uh, an expression in Hebrew that says, Yafe koach haben mikoach ha'av. The power or the potential or the energy of the son is greater than that of the father. This is, uh, uh, this is an expression, an idiom, that uh, def- depicts a certain situation in which the the son excels in something more than the father or exceeds the father in holiness or righteousness. And so the term goes that in some cases you can say, Yafe koach haben, the, the power of the son is greater, is more beautiful, is greater, more valuable than the power of the father. But then there's a Hasidic reading of this idiom. And the Hasidic idiom of this idiom, because the, the, Hasidic, the Hasidic ear hears that maybe the father is insulted, that that he's that you know too much too much of attention and too much compliments are given to the son also maybe it's not good for the son's education to hear that he's so much better than the father so the hasidim take the same expression 
And according to the rule that is used many, many times, that every time we have this letter Mem, which means more than something, Yafe Koach Aben Mi Koach Av, more than the, the power of the Father, that, that Mem, that letter Mem, can be read as deriving from, not better than or more than, but getting its energy from this other thing. So now we can read this whole term as saying, the power of the sun is very great, very beautiful. Where did he get it all from? He, all, he got it from the Father. So it was the, the sun goes, you know, takes the legacy of the Father one step further. This is what every parent should really wish for and hope for. And whatever we do, our children will carry on and go further than where we got to. We got to a certain point, and then we give them all the energy, and we pass on the energy to them, and then we hope for them, and we wish for them to excel and exceed more than we have, to go further than we have. But we should all know it's really it's coming from the parents. And the child should know this, that although I, I, I made it farther than my parent, it's, it's because of my parent. It's, I have to thank my parent. I got the energy from him. And the only reason I was able to climb further or higher or go deeper, whatever it is, it's because I was able to take his energy from him. It's a bit like, you know, billiard balls, that one hits the other, and then the one that hits the other stops moving, and then the second one begins moving, the second one got the energy from the first one. You could say that the first ball got only as far as the second ball, then it, then it stopped, and then the second ball started going, and it went further, and maybe it hit the goal that the first ball, the first ball was aiming at. So the, the power of the sun, of the second generation, second ball is bigger, greater than the power. It got further than the first one, but it got so by virtue of the energy of the first ball hitting it. And this is demonstrated in a beautiful, beautiful little idea that's hidden in the words father and son in Hebrew. The two words father and son in Hebrew are very short words. They're each two letters long. Father is Av. It's just the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph Bet. Av, that's father. Abba is Aramaic. That's an, and the second Aleph is an Aramaic addition. But the Hebrew word is Av. And then the, the Hebrew word for son is again a two-letter word, it's ben, bet nun. So what's beautiful about this? That if you take the word av, and you can see it as the acronym of av ben. So within the first av, the first aleph is just the av itself, and then the bet of the av, the second letter, is already the first letter of the son. So av is the acronym for av ben, father, son. But then it goes on. Ben, the, the second two-letter word, son or child, Ben is the acronym for Ben Neched, son, grandson. So the father contains the son, or contains the seed of the son, right, the first letter of the son in its second letter, and the son contains the seed of the grandson in its second letter. We can all put it. We can all put it together and create one word, which is Evan. Evan is a stone. Aleph bet nun av ben neched. The three generations. This is what we have: here. Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. Is av ben neched, and and each one and the the first two letters are av, and the second two letters are ben. And the stone is a bit like the billiard ball. It's a stone that gets its energy from one place and moves it to the other place. So this is a be- just a beautiful little way of getting into this topic of the three generations and how they're all both continuing the first generation and going on to the next generation. So what when what we want to do now is we want to um, ask of we want to start with these generations and we want to understand their their dynamic. And we want to answer some very basic, deep, wide Jewish questions using using this. This is like a like almost like a first class in what Judaism is all about. And in the second half, it's almost going to be like a first class in Kabbalah also. Actually, throughout the, the, the class, it's going to be like this now. It's like an introduction to a basic... Many of you know this, but it's always good to go back to the basics 
and and you know look at them again because it's really foundational. So we want to figure out why is Judaism created over a dynamic of three generations? Why doesn't it start out with a very unique and amazing individual who you know rebels against the world of idolatry and begins believing in the one God in Hashem and then merits to be called Israel? It didn't happen that way. There was a very unique individual. His name was Abraham, and he never got to, to, uh, to have the name Israel. We know that the name Israel was there since before creation. And it, it was waiting for the right person to come along and reach the stage that he was able to fully carry that name and to carry the burden of that name and the full meaning of that name, which means someone who can, who can almost vanquish, so to speak, uh, God and men. This is what was said to Jacob when he battled the angel and, and merited to have the name Israel. So it took three generations. Why three generations? Why this dynamic? And many, many very basic, you know, age-old questions are answered through this. So before really going into this one final uh, piece of introduction, is that this secret of the three generations, of the grandfather, the father, and the grandson, or father, son, and grandson, uh, have to do with one of the names given to the Jewish people, which is Am Segula. This word Segula is a very interesting word. What is Am Segula? So the simplest meaning is that Segula is something like a treasure. It's a unique property that's only given to a certain individual or group in this case, and it's uh, it's and it, and it's it's something unique. It's, if it's if it's something that's uh, you know omnipresent or ubiquitous, it, it's not a treasure anymore. So Segula is a, a, is a certain rare quality. That's the simplest meaning of the word. But the word segula is also connected to another Hebrew word, which is segol. What is the segol? I'm not talking about the power, sorry, the color purple. The color purple, the word segol, segol is purple in Hebrew, but that's modern Hebrew, very modern, very, very late word, invented either late 19th century or early 20th century. But segol is a very ancient word, and segol is one of the punctuation marks in Hebrew. It's the punctuation mark that is made out of, out of three dots, one like this, one like this, one like this, which we've mentioned before, it's the basic structure of the sefirot, it's the basic dynamic of the sefirot, that they go in the right direction, direction of right hand side, and then the left hand direction, and then you go to the middle line, and that also means going lower. So it means it goes through the three points, this is really the foundation of the philosophical concepts of thesis, antithesis, antithesis, and synthesis, right? We have the three stages of an evolution, or a, it's called dialectic in philosophy, something that appears, but it always takes three stages to appear. So this has to do with the segol, and also with us being the amsegula. We can ask, why are we called, why are the Jewish people called amsegula? Because the treasure, the secret that they hold on to is the secret of the segol, of the three dots, the three points, and the dynamic, the dialectic dynamic, which was later made famous by great philosophers, which spoke about, again, thesis, antithesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Um, but it, it's, an age, it's an ancient secret that was most elaborated in Kabbalah. So that's really, that could be one of the explanations for why we're called Amsgula. So, and also, by the way, sometimes it's not the punctuation marks the goal, sometimes it's one of the Te'amim. That's the, also, not exactly punctuation, it's also a mark, but it's, it's a mark as to how to sing, how to pronounce, not just the punctuation, but also how to, I don't, I don't, I don't know the, the exact English words, but it's, it's, it's like how you sing it. It's a form of song when you read the Torah in, in synagogue, 
there is a kind of melody. And the melody is, is there in the Te'amim. And one of the Te'amim is an upside down Segol. In this, in this case, it's two dots with the third dot being on top of them. And so the Ashkenazim also call this Segol. But, it, but if they speak of the Nikud, then the third dot is, in, is below. If they speak of the Tam, the third dot is above. Sfaradim call this a slightly different name. They call this Segolta. But again, it's all coming from Segol. So the idea is that this is a deep secret in Judaism, and it has to do with the three fathers. So, generally speaking, Abraham is like the right-hand first point, or sefirah. It corresponds to the right-hand line of the sefirot, and most dominantly to the sefirah of chesed, loving-kindness. Abraham is the chariot, that's the expression he carries, he's the vehicle, he's the vessel for the divine attribute of loving kindness. He embodies love. So the first dot, the beginning of this dialectic, is love. Then his son, which gets his energy from him, but takes it in a different direction, in the opposite direction, his son, Yitzchak, Isaac, is the, is the left-hand dot that's right opposite him. And this is the dot, this is the left-hand line, and it, the and most prominently is the sefira of Gvura, which is translated as might. Might is the power to limit and the power to focus and the power to separate. And this and the embodiment of this is Yitzchak. We had to have we ha, we need to have all generations in order to get through all these stages. And these stages tell us something about how to achieve balance. So Abraham is love and Yitzchak is Gvura, might, and also it's, it's known by the attribute of fear or awe. Awe is a type of fear, and it's the opposite energy, we'll explain in a minute, of, of Chesed. And then you have the third generation, uh, Yaakov, which becomes Israel, and the, this is the middle line. The middle line goes below the first two, if, the, if we're talking about the punctuation marks, Segol. And it's going further down, but it also balances and connects the first two. This is called Tiferet, sometimes translated as beauty, sometimes translated as harmony. Tiferet means a harmonious balance. And it also has to do with the uh, attribute of compassion. So this is Yaakov. Now we have to figure out why. How do their stories embody these elements? But just in order to complete the structure, we said that Segol could be a, a downward-pointing triangle or an upward-pointing triangle. So how does it go that it's an upward-pointing triangle? The idea is that although the third generation, Isaac, goes further down into reality by implementing the legacy of his father and his grandfather, uh, which were there before, and he's in the in the middle. He balances them, but he also he's able be, by imp, by balancing them to go down and implement it. It's always a rule in Kabbalah that when you have a synthesis of two opposites, although it appears to be lower, it doesn't have the same amazing energy of the more extreme poles. If you go all in one direction, all in another direction, there's high energy. Uh, but if you want to balance them or take them together, you go lower. This is one of the reasons Yaakov is going lower. However, this synthesis, is its root is higher than both opposites. So the, although Yaakov is the third one, the latest one, the youngest one, and the one that doesn't have this high energy that his father and grandfather had, really he gets to inherit the name Israel, which preceded both Abraham and Isaac. That's what we asked in the beginning. How, what, the name was there from the very beginning, since before creation. The, the ideal, the idea of, is, of Israel. Israel as a, as a balanced force that's able to manifest godliness in the most balanced way. He was waiting for the right person. So the right person was the grandchild, again, the youngest one, the one that gets all his energy and is, you know, he's the, the, the dwarf that stands on the shoulders of giants, 
who are the giants, his father and grandfather. So he's the smallest one, the youngest one. But he really, and this, this connects to the upper, the upward pointing Segol or Segolta, Yaakov, so, and that's why he has two names. Yaakov is the lower name. This is the downward pointing Segol. But really, he gets to merit, he merits to have the name Israel, which is the up, up, uppermost point. So really, we have both the Segol and the Segolta, or both the punctuation Segol and the Ta'am Segol. So that's just, generally speaking, what do they represent? Now let's go into their characters and stories. So many people know this. They know that Abraham is loving kindness and that Isaac is might or fear and that and that uh, Jacob is tiferet beauty harmony but it doesn't they, they don't they, it's hard for them to see where do we see it in the story we need to see it in the story in the pshat in the in the simple level of the story we have to see this otherwise it doesn't make any sense so let's try and see this so um uh We'll start, actually, before we go into their characters, we just want to say that just this structure uh, answers two great mysteries. And this begins to connect us to the story also. The two mysteries are, well, three mysteries. One is, why do we need three generations? So if we have this uh, dialectic, this, dyna this dynamic of, th of thesis, antithesis, and, and synthesis, uh, it, it begins to make sense that we need three generations. And then we have two more mysteries. The first mystery is why four mothers and not three mothers? Why the whole crazy spiel with Yaakov ending up having two sisters as wives and then even and then even two more as their maidservants? But it starts with the two wives. Why? As we, every child sings in Passover, Shlosha mi who knows the meaning of three? It's the three fathers. Who knows the meaning of four? It's the four mothers. And every child, it bugs him a little bit. Why, why, if we have four mothers, maybe we should have three or four fathers. And if we have three fathers, maybe we should have three mothers. So now we understand this. We understand because Abraham and Isaac are, as we said, two opposite extremes. They're unbalanced, and they're pulling in opposite directions. They have great energy, but they don't get to inherit the name Israel because they don't have the balance. But they need a little bit of a balance. Where does the balance come from? It comes from their wives. Abraham is all chesed. His wife is, is, is she's his wife, she's like him, but she also balances him. She adds a little bit of gvura. That's maybe where... Yitzchak gets his gvura from his mother. So, Sarah balances Abraham. Yitzchak is all gvura, all might, all fear. And his wife is with him, but she's also a little bit against him, as we know from Adam and Eve. Ezer kenegdo. The, she needs to be a helper opposite him, meaning she needs to pull him in the opposite direction a little bit. The wife needs to pull the husband, the spouse in general. But here it's the mothers balancing the fathers in a very clear way. So Rivka needs to balance Yitzchak. When we get to the third generation, you, could, you can understand this in two ways. You can say, well, Yaakov is so balanced, maybe he doesn't need a wife at all, because he's so balanced. He's Tiferet, he's harmony. He has a little bit of the father, a little bit of the grandfather, and he's able to combine it into a harmonious whole. But there's another way. So you could say that, but we know it's, that's not what happens. He, he doesn't remain single. He, he needs to carry on. The whole point of the balance is that he carries on. So maybe he needs a balanced wife, you could say. If he's so balanced, you just find him a very balanced one wife. And they'll both be the most balanced couple in the world. Turns out that very balanced people also have a danger. And the danger is because they're so balanced, they could they could tear open, they could be split open and, and have it like a split personality because they, they're able to identify so much with both sides of the argument. Imagine people who listen to an argument and they identify with both sides 
And because they identify, they could one moment, if, if, if left with, you know, if they're left with one person, they'll go there. Then if they're left with the other person, they'll go there. So a very balanced person, you could say, needs two wives. <laughs> he needs two wives. Of course, today, in our generation, we don't want to marry two women. Uh, we want to each wife to, to have both Rachel and Leah within her, right? And this is why in Kabbalah, it's a tradition in Kabbalah to abstract Rachel and Leah and turn them into two aspects of one thing. It was like that in the Zohar, it was like that in the Arizal, it's like that later on in Hasidut. Either there are two worlds, or there are two partufim, the, archi the godly archetypes, or there are two aspects of the soul. But Kabbalah has always made them two aspects of one thing in order to teach us that, God forbid, we should marry two women. The idea is that every woman should have both aspects. But the, the Tanakh tells us the story in a very figurative way. And in that generation, that's how it had to be. So he needs two wives. And indeed, Rachel is more like Rivka. And she balances the Yitzchak within him. And, and Leah is more like Sarah. And she balances the Avraham within him. So... Again, you could say that being balanced, it doesn't need any balance. But it's not true. If you're balanced, you need two balance, two balances. So, so that's an, and so two mysteries are have the beginning of a solution, with just with the understanding that the three fathers correspond to the three sefirot, and the three lines of Kabbalah, and this dynamic of dialectic. We know why it takes three generations, and we can have it. A very interesting answer to why we need, why, why the third one needs to have two wives. Third mystery is the mystery of the two rejected sons. Why do we have these two rejected sons? First Ishmael and then Esav. What, 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 what are their purpose in the story? And, and now we figure this out also. Because only the third generation is balanced then the first two generations, because they're unbalanced, if they're going in one extreme, and they, and they don't have the opposite extreme, then they're going to end up having two children. The first, continuing the trajectory of the father further into that extreme, and losing the balance completely. And a son that is going to bring us, to, to, to create the balance. So Avraham had two sons, first Ishmael, and that was the firstborn, because he carries on, in a way, the legacy of Abraham even more. It sounds, it sounds crazy, but I'll, tell, I'll explain what I mean. Ishmael, it's not that he carries the legacy, but he continues along the trajectory, the dangerous trajectory, that Abraham is on if, if left unbalanced. So it's chesed without any, it's loving kindness without any might. What you end up, by the way, is if you're going so extreme in that direction, you're going to flip all the way in the other direction. Where do we see this? We see this in the legacy of Ishmael, which is the, which is the religion of Islam. Religion of Islam begins with uh, following the trajectory of Abraham. Why? This is another important element of the three of the three sefirot. Abraham goes from the top down. Chesed, loving kindness, is going down into this world. And Ishmael and Islam are all about creating a godly kingdom on earth. It's very earthly. They don't want monasteries. They don't want, you know, the world to come. Although it's famous that that shahids are promised rewards in the world to come, but that's because we need the shahid to help build, I mean, the Islam needs the shahid to help the build the, the kingdom down here. But the ultimate purpose is the kingdom down here. It's very much the purpose of, of Islam. So what, but, but what they ended up with is that it starts with this trajectory of chesed, going down into the world and having the entire world learn about God, but because it's unbalanced, it ends up having the most gvura, having a sword on its flag, and and carrying the sword and making it a, a the, the symbol 
of the religion and 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 the idea of submission, both submission to God in a very mighty, mighty like way, gvura like way, and also they're very much connected to the angel Gavriel. Gavriel comes from gvura. And then you have the second rejected son. The second rejected son is a sav, and he's coming from Yitzchak. And it's the same thing. The first two generations are unbalanced, and they, they're, they're pulling in opposite direction. Of course, Abraham and Yitzchak were very holy, but there were stages in the dynamic. And the, the, the son that doesn't get it, that's, that's, that thinks, I need to, to, care, to take the energy of the father and continue all the way, he, he's the one who's rejected because he doesn't get the thing. So Ishmael was rejected, but then Yitzchak understood that a balance needs to be made. So he went in the opposite direction. But then the same thing reiterated itself. We have a second iteration. Again, we have two children being born. It's not exactly the same thing because they're twins and they're born of the same mother. But the, the, again, there's a first one and a second one. And the first one, more beloved by the father... Um, attempt at going all the way with the trajectory of his father Yitzchak. So what is that trajectory? If Chesed is all about going downwards into this world, Yitzchak is all about going upwards, leaving this world, looking to constantly upwards and seeking constant unity with God to completely reject the world. That's the power of Gvura, to reject this world and look only for God. And, and then Esav takes that, and we see that where, just like before, we see this in the religion that came from Esav, which is Christianity. Christianity started out as a very um, ascetic religion. It wants to let go of this world, to leave this world, to leave with the least material, and then it ended up having the monks and monasteries, and go all the way up, it all comes from Gvura. But again, because it's un checked, because it's unbalanced, it ends up adopting the opposite, going to the opposite extreme of only talking about love and peace and grace and loving everyone equally, And but although their root, it starts with Gvura. So, and what you have in both religions, although they're very much opposites, uh, they have they start out first only by going with Chesed and then ending up by having a lot of Gvura, and the first one begins with a lot of gvura and ends up being with too much chesed uh, in its theology, let's say. If not in practice, then it's in its theology, it's a very unchecked, unbalanced chesed, which is a reaction to its being first founded on too much gvura. But then you get to the third generation, which is Yaakov. Yaakov doesn't, there's no rejected son. The expression in Chazal is mitato shlema, his bed, when he was lying, when he was dying on his bed, on his deathbed, and he left this world surrounded by all of his children, all of his children were there, and all of them were righteous, and all of them promised to carry on his mission. No son was rejected. So on his deathbed, he had this feeling of wholeness, mitato shlema. It also alludes to the to the intimate union, the bed, the bed that's whole, alludes subtly to the intimate union with the wives, that all of the progeny that came from all of the wives was again whole. So the progeny that came out of his bed was whole. So two interpretations for the same idea that all of his children, many children, 12 sons and one girl, all of them carried on his legacy, and no one needs to be rejected. And they were able to take all the many, many aspects of what Judaism is all about and create really the, like the Choshen, right? The 12 gems that each one has its own color, its own precious value and, and properties. And, and you can put them on one breastplate and it's, and it's there and it's holy and it's balanced. This is really the epitome of Tiferet, of harmony. It's on the chest, all the 12 Gemstones are there, and it's lower than Avraham and uh, and Yitzchak, but its its root is far higher because this was the machshavat chila, the initial thought 
that would that only manifest itself in the third and final uh, generation. So now let's look a little bit at, at the details of at the details of uh, of the of the story. So why is Abraham Chesed? And you know, as we'll do this, I'm thinking I'm thinking out loud. How much should we go into? Because it's uh, it's rather late now. Um, no, no, we'll go with this. So, the why is Abraham a vessel for loving kindness? So, it begins with a very simple thing, which is that Abraham, in a world of idolatry, in a world of separation, in a world of darkness, in the sense that it hides the unity of God, begins to give light. Abraham is the first step. The first thing everywhere, everything, in every process, in every uh, new venture, everything that you do, you need to start with a lot of light and a lot of love. And you need to do this in an energy that moves and expands. And this is Abraham. Abraham begins his journey with Lech Lecha, go unto thee. And then he travels all across Eretz Israel, and then he travels some more, and he goes to Egypt, and he goes back, and he goes to fight wars, gets all the way to Damascus, and wins the war, and goes back, and he's constantly moving. So the energy is being open and spreading and expanding. If you think maybe it's more care, more you know, uh, safer to uh, start with contraction, with limitation with, you know, being very rational about everything and being very measured, then you're wrong according to this dialectic. That's, that's starting off on the left foot, and it's a double meaning word because the left line is Yitzchak. You need to start off on the right foot, and this is Abraham, which means a lot of love, a lot of kindness. You open the tent in all direction, you're open to all the guests, whatever, you know, place they come from on, on earth, North, south, east, and west, and and so again, it's unbalanced. Abraham is unbalanced. How do you call a situation when you have more lights than vessels? A lot of light, a lot of, a lot of love, not enough vessels. This is called chaos. There's a little bit of chaos in Abraham. He was born in the world of chaos. He was born dur- during the first 2,000 years, which are called the two millennia of chaos in Chazal. He was called the giant. This is very interesting. Those two first two millennia, giants walked the earth. Giants are a metaphor for the world of chaos, the world of Tohu. Immense lights that the world can't contain. Abraham was called a giant. He wasn't a physical giant. He was a spiritual giant. But the fact that he was called a giant alludes to the world of chaos. He was born in that world. And in a way, he carried that chaotic energy with him throughout his life. It enabled him to start afresh every day, to circumcise himself when he was 99 years old, and to still go on living 76 years more, and every day to be Baba Yamin, coming into the days, and fulfilling and living out each day to its fullest potential, because he he experienced the beginning of everything. Everything was beginning for him. And this, we should all aspire to be, to have this energy from Abraham. We need to start off, although it's unbalanced. And you end up loving Ishmael and Yitzchak together. And you want them to be together. You need your wife to tell him it, it, it can't work, it doesn't work. It's a, it's a nice ideal, it's a nice, you know, peace and love for everyone. But it doesn't work in this world. You need to, you need to make some distinctions and separations. And you need to make sure that, you know, you need to see which one can, can really inherit you and which one not yet. And later on you can redeem him also. So he, he doesn't have that balance because his love is universal. It's all-encompassing. So he's this great light. He's a giant of light, a giant of love. And, and this is the energy of chesed. Chesed is blind universal love. You love because you believe everything is worthy of love. Everything should be loved. So this is why Abraham, his character, his, his, the actual biography, not as an archetype, not as a, as a uh, you know, abstraction, a Kabbalistic ex- abstraction. As the character we read about in the story, 
the fact that he was on the move, the fact that he had this hospitality, the fact that he was into converting, the fact that he was able to remain young all the time, the fact that he was able to to move away from the world of idolatry and break it, also this breaking of the of the statues of his father, also a bit chaotic. He rebelled against his father very much. Now, this, ba- this Baal Tshuva, right? Avraham was a Baal Tshuva. He was the first convert, because he was born a non-Jew and he became a Jew. So he was a convert, or a Baal Tshuva. And now we, you have the second generation. Many of, many of you here are Baal Tshuva, and you know this experience of being a Baal Tshuva, and then having a son who's FFB, right? From, from birth. So Yitzchak is the first FFB in the world, the first from, from, from birth. And he's, he's a dos, you know, he's a dati. And he's called Tzaddik ben Tzaddik, second generation. He has a lot of things Abraham didn't have. Well, two things in particular. He has a Brit Milah on the eighth day, not, a, not when he's 99, which is a, a, a big thing, because he's, he's taken, he, he, he takes the covenant with God for granted. He didn't choose it, he didn't think about it, he didn't realize it at the age of 99, or, or at the age of 13, like Ishmael. He, it's there as a given, since, since it's from the beginning of his conscious self. The circumcision is there. He's part of the thing. And this is a very high thing, and it, Abraham didn't have this. He also has a bar mitzvah, something else that Abraham didn't have. And there are two, these are the two explanations for what was the banquet that Abraham gave uh, when after Yitzchak was born. So it either was the circumcision or it was the bar mitzvah. Two things. Abraham didn't have. So, but, but, but Yitzchak, this Dati religious son of the Baal Tshuva, is completely unlike his father. He wants to be very, very, he doesn't want to move around. He likes to stay in one country, one land. He never leaves it. He's very focused. And he... He doesn't want to change anything. It's always said that the fact that he redug his father's wells and he gave them the same names that his father gave, gave them, uh, this is he's seen as a symbol of conservatism. He's a conservative. He's not a revolutionary. He wants to continue on. He, but in a way, it's not, that, it's not that simple because I think Abraham, if judging by his character, didn't want him to just redig his old wells or just give them the same names. He wanted him to do something new, just like he did something new. And in this sense, we can imagine maybe Yitzchak disappointing his father a little bit by being so squarish. You know, he's a bit of a mis- it's a bit like a chosid father and a misnagged son, a little bit. We had a lot of chosid sons with misnagged fathers, right? We had this a lot. All the first generations of chasidut was uh, the, 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 the parents were all anti Hasidut because they didn't know what it was all about and they were afraid maybe it's back to Shabtaut. But then you had the, the sons discovering what Hasidut is all about. And in our generation, sometimes you have situations in which there's a, the father is a Hasid, like Abraham, and he wants his son to be a Hasid, but the son says, You gave me this from world and now I want to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. And I want to be very, very squirish, very halachic, very nigle. And I don't want to go abroad. I don't want to learn other languages. I don't want to be a man of the world. I want to be a very straightforward, observing, God-fearing Jew. And that's it. You were talking to me about the, all the worlds you've been through in the 60s or the 80s or the 90s and all those. I don't, I'm not interested in that. I just want to be an heir to Israel. I just want to marry one woman. You had one woman, then she gave you her maidservant, then when she died, you took another woman, maybe it's the same maidservant, maybe it's another one, maybe it's Pilegshim in the plural, maybe it's one Pilegesh. But I just want Rivka. That's another thing that he's very focused on. He has one country and one spouse, which is Rivka. He's absolutely monogamous. When they can't have children, they don't even, it doesn't occur to them to take a maidservant. They start praying that they should have children. This is in, in our part and our segment. That they, they, it doesn't even cross their minds that maybe they can take a maidservant and she can carry the children, which is the same thing the father does and the son will do. 
which is to take maid servants when the when the mother can't bear children. For them, it's not. It's a non-option. It just doesn't exist. He's focused. He's very. He's walking straight lines. He's very uh, strict in in observing what he knows. He should focus on. So and now the father may be a little bit disappointed. The Hasid Val Tshuva father, who is a man of the world, who probably speaks many languages, and is very versed in you know maybe all seventy languages. You know he was there when the when the Tower of Babel happened. You know and all the languages were dispersing, and and he was, uh, and he saw all the world. You know he moved from country to country until choosing or realizing that Eretz Yisrael is the chosen place. You know, he went to ashrams and he went to all kinds of places and he knew the idol world and then he broke them. It's, Mamish, we have this in our generation. And then he has a son who grows to a cheder and goes to a yeshiva and he doesn't understand why, why is the father constantly talking about all those worlds, those chaotic worlds. Because the father is too much into lights. He's always into lights and lights and the energy and the experience. The, the son wants vessels. Now the parent could be a little bit disappointed that the son is such a. I'll, 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 I'll turn it into a caricature because anyway I'm connecting it to our generation. The son is a little bit nerdy, the son is a little bit too squarish, and is a little bit like a regular dati person, you know, and he, he's disappointed. But he shouldn't be disappointed, because the son is doing what Yitzchak did to Abraham. He's taking the lights and he's saying, "Well, you're a man of lights." And that's great. That's how things should start. My purpose in life is to build vessels. I want to build vessels. And I want to stay put. And I want to, I want to do every day what I did the, the, the day before, and I would do a little better. And I'm going to focus on my one wife, and I'm going to focus on this one place, and I'm going to dig the same wells that you dig, and to make sure they're preserved. And, and this will keep things going. And this is my purpose. So Yitzchak is Gvura. Because he's focused, because he's very halachic in the sense that he wants limitations. And, and very interestingly, why does he love Esav? Why does he love Esav? So interestingly, the reason he loves Esav is that he thinks Esav will make the balance between him and his father. Because Esav is also a man of the world a little bit. He goes outside, and he plays, and he hunts, and he goes into the field. He doesn't realize that his child needs the balance, that is that the child needs to first grow like him, very, very safe, very kept, well kept in the tent, and then to be a man of the world, which is ultimately what happens to Yaakov. But he thinks that having those lights again, he says, well, Esav is now the balance. He's my son, but he, take, he has all those crazy lights that my father had. So he's mistaken. He, he, mis he, he, he thinks it's the, it's the wrong child, the one to carry on the legacy. Now, just to finish this, the story, because these two generations are so opposite, they're so unlike, and sometimes they look at each other and maybe Abraham is saying, I can't believe you're my son. He doesn't say it, but maybe he thinks a little bit. And Yitzchak maybe is also looking at his father and saying, I can't believe you're my father. We're so different. That's what they need, the binding of Isaac, the Akedah. In the Zohar, the, the Akedah is not just a trial for Abraham to see if he's a believer and not just a message that we want to let go of human sacrifices and we want to replace them with animal sacrifices and the usual things that are explained. It's, the Zohar says the binding of Isaac really means the binding of Isaac to Abraham and the binding of Abraham to Isaac. The purpose of the, of the binding is that they're binded and inter-included. And indeed, when it's over, God tells Abraham, now I see that you are God-fearing, that you have fear which is the property of Isaac. That's the, the final story, the final verse in the story of the binding. Now I knew, says God, that you are God-fearing. Before I knew that you loved me, but you didn't fear me because you didn't do something you feared. You did something you need to have fear for me in order to do, which is to, to sacrifice your own son. And Yitzchak 
demonstrates the utmost love to God by being willing to die for God. You should love your God with all of your um, heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And the soul means even if he expects you to give back your soul, to die. And, and Yitzchak demonstrates the utmost love for God and Abraham demonstrates the utmost fear for God. Which he, and and which is doing the opposite of what he loves, and and then they're interincluded. They come out of the binding at a very late age, by the way, for both of them, but they come out of the binding, understanding each other after years of misunderstanding. Years of misunderstanding one another. And then finally we have Yaakov, and Yaakov, as I said, grows up, like Itzchak well-guarded, well-kept, in a tent, just like Yitzchak was well-kept in his, in his country. And, and therefore, he's very tamim. But then, just like his father, but then his mother makes sure that he goes and, 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 and explores the world and gets to know the world. And he goes over to Haran, where Abraham came from, and he meets all those bad people, and he missed, he confronts idol worship and how to fight against it, and he ends up being, he starts out being like his father, ends up being like his grandfather. And this is the middle line and the middle sefira, which goes lower, it doesn't have the high energy of the first two generations, but it balances them and connects them. And this is the, in this way the verse says, Yaakov asher padayet Avraham. Yaakov redeems Abraham. Where is Isaac? Isaac is not the thing now. The, the point now is that it's the third generation, Yaakov, that redeems Abraham. And what does it mean, redeem? He takes the light of Abraham, the love of Abraham, and he puts it into the vessels of Yitzchak, the father. And that's how he's able to create the balance. That's why all of his children are with him at his deathbed. All of them some were more problematic than others. It wasn't easy. There was the whole story of Joseph. It's not like the, it's a, it's a, it's a, the ideal, you know, the picture of you know domestic tranquility. Far from it. The story of Jacob's family, but despite all the turmoils, they're ultimately all there, and it's all Jewish names that are carried, you know, you know, proudly. All the names of the tribes. Uh, even Shimon and Levi, which had, uh, you know, some violent streak to them, and and even everyone, they're all kulam kedoshim. They're all holy, they're all good. And they're, because he was able to make the balance between the two, the two previous generations. Hi, if you enjoyed this video, please press like and subscribe to the channel. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Patreon is a platform for supporting independent creators. You can find the link in the description below. Thank you very much.